to Sean Connery as a military officer teamed with Detective Mark Harmon in the Presidio. Bette Midler and Lily Tomlin play two sets of twins in Big Business. And baseball groupie Susan Sarandon has her eye on player Kevin Costner in Bull Durham. It's all coming up next on Cisco and Ebert. Bette Midler star as two sets of twins, one pair of city slickers, one pair of country bumpkins in the comedy Big Business. It's one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert. I'm Gene Cisco of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named Big Business, and this is one of those comedies that sounds great on paper but delivers surprisingly few laughs on the screen. The film stars Bette Midler and Lily Tomlin as two sets of twins who were mixed up at birth so there's one Midler and one Tomlin in each family. The way things work out, one set of Midler and Tomlin wind up as rich kids in New York, owners of a multinational conglomerate, and the other set are poor but proud craftsmen in the small southern hamlet of Jupiter Hollow, where they manufacture porch furniture. The New York pair owns Jupiter Hollow, and so when the New York Midler decides to sell that little town to an unscrupulous Italian who wants to strip mine the town out of existence, the Southern sisters decide to go to New York to protest the sale of their company. Leave town? Go to New York City? It's a dangerous, dirty, low-down place, baby. I know. I know. Oh, my God. What will I wear? I gotta get my hair cut. Oh, this is just the sense of purpose I need. I gotta get me some of those press all nails. Do those things stay up? I wouldn't want them flopping off in any of those... Fancy nightclubs! Listen, nightclubs, this is business. Now, you get a grip on yourself. We're going to New York City! In New York, all four sisters wind up checking into the Plaza Hotel at about the same time. And since both sets of sisters look exactly identical, that leads to all sorts of confusion at the reservations desk. I want our room, and I want it now. Uh, yes, ma'am. I can give you the suite right next door. It's identical. I'll have the bellboy take up your luggage. The whole middle hour of the movie consists of variations on the same theme, which is how the various twins just barely miss running into each other. Moron. This leads me to a basic rule of comedy, Gene, which is that it's never funny when two people just miss running into each other. It's always funny when they run into each other and don't expect to, but the other is never funny, and that causes big, big problems for big business, which might have been a funnier movie also if they'd spent more time on developing the opposing personalities of these various twins and less time on that endless series of sight gags in which one twin disappears around the corner just when the other pops up. The movie does not represent the best work of either Midler or Tomlin, who both seem curiously muted here in contrast to the sharp-edged characters they usually play. The plot grinds lifelessly through a series of predictable encounters and non-encounters until the big moment when the two sets of twins finally meet. And you know what happens then? After a brief scene where the four women realize who they all must be, the movie cuts to the next scene. We never get the scene we were waiting for all along where they actually say, hey, we must have been mixed up at birth. You're really my sister. I wanted to see both Tomlins get their revenge on both Midlers, and that priceless scene is missing. Well, I had some problems with the film, too. I think I liked it a little bit more than you, because I would say that one character or one actress is working close to the top of her form, and that's Bette Midler. In her characterization as the tough-talking, brassy owner of the company, the smart sister, that's the brassy Bette Midler that we enjoy. And when she's the country Bette Midler, in her opening sequence, she is also extremely funny because she's yodeling. And to hear Bette Midler on stage yodeling and prancing around the stage is very funny. Well, I agree with you that the movie, Tomlin is pretty much of a washout for me in both characters, except for one thing. She has a funny bit involving a snake hand that's uh, putting a curse on somebody. I guess my expectations may be very high when I get these two people and this premise. And I saw a lot of, I know what you're talking about, a lot of physical stuff rather than encounter yeah, stuff. Yeah. When they do meet, 
It's very funny, but not played along. Not played, not played out, and not played the way it should have been. I agree with you that of the four sisters, so to speak, the brassy New York Midler is the best of the four, but still not with all the stops let out, and so that when she does have those funny zinger lines, they're good, but there aren't enough of them. I think she's funnier than that. I think the movie's a little funnier than that. Our next movie is called A Taxing Woman. And here is a stunning surprise, a wonderful new film about, of all things, a Japanese woman who is an income tax agent. Dry subject, you would think? Not a dry movie. Apparently, the practice of evading taxes knows no borders. The problem is rampant in Japan, and this comic love story presents the problem in a consistently amusing way. Now, here is the agent on the left there with her assistant as they spy on a restaurant owner who is evading taxes by not ringing up all the sales. That's just one of the tricks. The film moves beyond trickery, though, into a subtle relationship when the tax agent confronts a wealthy man whom she sort of likes, even though he has a plan to cheat on his taxes. That's Nobuku Miyamoto as the tax agent, and she's absolutely charming. Their relationship also surprised me. It isn't always confrontational, and that's the way I thought it was going to go. The whole movie surprised me because I didn't think you could make an interesting movie about a tax agent's work that wasn't some kind of thriller. And this isn't a thriller, it's more subtle than that. A Taxing Woman was made by director Juzo Itami, the same director who made last year's wonderful film, Tampopo, about a bunch of tough guys helping a woman, again, played by his wife, the same character that we just saw, the same actress we just saw, about a woman learning how to make better noodles. Mm -hmm. Now, Atami is a very special talent, let's face it. He picks strange subjects and makes delightful films from them. I really liked A Taxing Woman. I didn't, and I'm a fan of Atami's. I liked his first film very much, too, The Funeral, and in all of these films he stars his wife, and Tampopo, of course, is the masterpiece. I saw it again not long ago, and this where it's a, it's a kind of a cross between the woman who wants to make noodles and then a spaghetti western, right. if you will, with a right. guy, the truck driver coming in. Why, why don't you like this film? The zen of perfect noodles. This movie doesn't have the same organization. It's very hard to follow. Uh, I lost my place several times. The characters are confusing. The jokes don't pay off. The situation... Well, I think if you lost your place... It's completely tedious. I think that if you lost your, if you lost your pe uh, place, that may be your problem. I found my place all over the place. I mean, I, th I think this is an absolutely wonderful film. The woman is uh, clever. She's torn between her code and the man. And it opened my eyes it to a whole world that it, it opened my eyes to a whole world that I didn't even know about. It just didn't have the discipline of the earlier film. It's too long. It's not well organized. It's rambling. It doesn't really make it. We didn't see the same. Is. We didn't oh, see the I same. We did. I think we did. No, it was a big disappointment. I especially enjoyed after it. seeing Tampopo, which is nearly a perfect movie. It's a wonderful film. This is good, too. Okay, when we come back, Sean Connery is a military cop in the Presidio. And then later, we'll also review Bull Durham, starring Kevin Costner as a minor league ball player with a major league mistress. <laughs> Our next movie is named The Presidio, and this is one of the least thrilling thrillers in a long time. A dumb, lifeless adventure in which two law enforcement officers solve between them the easiest investigation in recent movie history <laughs> while one of them has an affair with the other one's daughter which doesn't have anything to do with the investigation the film stars sean connery as a provost provost marshal on the presidio army base in san francisco and mark Harmon is a, a city cop who once served under connery and then had a big fight with him now an mp has been murdered on the base and the two men have got to work together on the investigation this is my command here you watch your mouth when you're here you understand me? Yes, sir. The movie has the usual dumb chase and action scenes, all of which seem recycled out of other movies. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. <laughs> Meg 
Ryan stars in the movie as Connery's daughter and, of course, falls in love with Harmon at first sight in some of the most awkward and unbelievable dialogue in many and many a moon. Is it hard? What hard? Being a policeman. Oh, yeah. Now, let's face it. Movies about two cops who have different lifestyles but have to work together are not exactly a dazzlingly new idea. I've seen about three of those this year, including a good one named Shakedown mm, that we good. saw not long ago. Peter Hyams, the man who directed The Presidio, even he made a good one himself, running scared with Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines. But The Presidio has absolutely nothing new or original to contribute to the subject, and there are stretches here where the movie looks like a cinematic trash recycling center. Mark Harmon is lifeless and not very interesting, and Sean Connery's good moments come from his own personality, not from anything contributed by the director or the screenplay. This is movie making by the numbers. I think by the numbers is dead on. Low numbers. I felt very low numbers. I felt as though I were watching a movie made for people who had never seen a movie and might not be able to uh, figure out how one scene connected. This and is a the training most, film. This is the most simple-minded piece of direction. Mm -hmm. It's a good-looking film, but yet it's like an idiot done for idiots. Look here. Now here I'm going to show you this, mm -hmm. and and I'm going to have they're going to have this conflict. And then it'll be resolved in the next scene. We won't keep you waiting too long. We'll resolve it real early because you don't have a yeah, long attention span. Yeah. This movie insults you know, the viewer. Well, I agree with that, and I, especially in terms of their so-called investigation. Oh, please. Now, I don't want to give away too many secrets. Give it away. But some people are smuggling some stuff, right? You got it. And uh, whatever it is, and however they're doing it. So the cop gets in an unmarked car with uh, the Army officer, Connery, who's wearing full uniform. They're, Both of these they, people are totally known to the guy that they're trailing. And they park the car across the street from yes. him and sit there looking at him while he, in plain view, goes around showing them everything they he need to find out so that they can figure out the and answer. And how long are they in the car? All day. Think about it. It goes on. They follow the well, man all day. Well, it takes that guy day. a long time to show them all of his secrets, yes. which he happily does. All I day mean, long. I mean, it's pretty dim-witted. Coming up next, Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon star in Bull Durham. A film about the joys and pains of minor league baseball. It's my job to give him life wisdom and help him get on to the major leagues. Our next film is called Bull Durham, a small jewel, a very funny, beautifully written film about baseball, minor league baseball, and the fringe characters that support it in a southern city. It's Durham, North Carolina, where veteran catcher Kevin Costner and a rookie pitcher with a great but wild arm end up caught in the middle of a fight over how to play the game and over the affections of a baseball groupie extraordinaire played by Susan Sarandon. Here all three confront each other in a bar as the rookie thinks Sarandon is his woman. Look, I don't believe in fighting, all right? Let's show All right, then. Hit me in the chest with that. I'd kill you. Yeah? From what I hear, you couldn't hit water if you fell out of a friggin' boat. Ow! Throw it. Throw it, come on. Right in the chest. No way. Come on, mate. You're not gonna hit me because you're starting to think about it already. Huh? Starting to think how embarrassing it would be to miss in front of all these people, how somebody might laugh. Come on, Rook. Show us that million dollar arm, because I got a oh, I got a good idea about that five cent head of yours. That's a very funny bit. Sarandon is really torn between the two men and her desire to help the team. I hook up with one guy a season. Usually it takes me a couple weeks to pick the guy. It's kind of my own spring training. And, yeah, well, you two are the most promising prospects of the season so far. Aside from the relationship, there is plenty of hilarious baseball action in this movie as the film takes us into the minds and private conversations of the players. This is a real treat. For example, a conference on the mound where the catcher tries to calm down the wild rookie pitcher. What the hell's going on out here? Well, Nick's scared because his eyelids are jammed and his old man's here. We need a live rooster. Was it a live rooster? We need a live rooster to take the curse off Jose's glove, and nobody seems to know what to get Millie or Jimmy for their wedding present. Is that about right? That's right. We're dealing with a lot of stuff. Well, uh, candlesticks always make a nice gift, and uh, 
Maybe you can find out where she's registered, maybe a place setting or maybe a silverware pattern. Okay, let's get two. Now, that's wonderful. And there are a lot of scenes like that in the movies. Interior monologues as the guy's getting ready to bat. All of us who love baseball always have wanted to be on the mound and really hear what they say. Listen to the interchange between catcher and batter. You get to do this in this wonderful movie. That's Tim Robbins as the rookie pitcher. He turns in a wonderful performance that makes him come across as some kind of wigged out David Letterman <laughs> lookalike. Susan Sarandon is marvelous in a great role. I hope she is remembered at Oscar time. She is required to play every position, if you will, <laughs> and we're not talking just baseball. She is sexy and bright and funny. It is a full, wonderful character, and she is equal to it. And let's give Kevin Costner credit for taking the somewhat thankless, less flashy role as a durable, beaten-down catcher. Now, he's a big star. He could have said, nah, this part's too small for me, but he makes Bull Durham work. Every part of this movie works. It was written and directed by a former minor league player, Ron Shelton, and his experience shows, because someone who knows an awful lot about baseball and loves it, created now, this I movie. I didn't know that Ron Shelton had anything to do with minor league baseball. But what I felt as I watched this movie was, you know, because so many baseball movies have really been so corny, yes. especially if you love the game of baseball, yes. this movie feels authentic, oh, it yeah. smells authentic, it plays authentically, and it is genuinely a funny funny movie in which all of these characters, not only the three you've mentioned, but also the other guys in the bullpen Manager. and so forth, and the people they meet on the road, right. are so well drawn. This is really one of the funniest comedies of the year. There's no question about it. I mean, to be able to write this kind of characters, I guess you've had to live it. And uh, you know, every, they say everybody has one story to tell and write what you know about. Mm -hmm. This um, guy Shelton sure did it. He sure did. When we come back, Traveling North, the story of an old curmudgeon whose retirement gives his second wife a full-time job. Patriotism is the final refuge of scoundrels. Our next movie is a genuine pleasure and a genuine discovery, a warm-hearted human comedy about a crusty Australian engineer and labor union activist who retires and settles in a little cabin by the side of a bay where he hopes to do some fishing. The man is played by Leo McKern, the great character actor who does Rumpel of the Bailey on PBS, and this is probably the best performance of his career, an Australian Academy Award winner which he manages to be lovable without budging one inch from his irascible, stubborn self. His lover truly loves him, but at one point she's driven away by his bad temper. I've realized that while I've loved mankind in general, I've been very thoughtless to some of those I've been involved with in particular. You there? Yes, I'm here. So I've, uh, I've run to uh, apologize. They marry, and she returns to his dream cabin, but one day he gets some bad news. He has a heart condition, and he ought to take it easy. Well, retirement shouldn't mean taking it easy, but not for this guy. Well, how will this affect my, my life patterns? Well, you just take things easy. Relax. Don't lose your temper. Never let yourself get too excited. Well, what about the, um, the more intimate areas? Are you still, uh... I may be old. I'm not defunct. Some subtle tension builds up between McKern and two of the men in town, that doctor and also McKern's next-door neighbor, who both like him, but they're bachelors and they're only human, and they can't help wondering what's going to happen to his wife if anything happens to him, because both of them would like to marry her. The beautiful thing about Traveling North is that the movie has the ability to observe life as it is actually lived. Leo McKern and Julia Blake, as the wife, create characters here who are real and recognizable. This is kind of a no-nonsense, unsentimental version of On Golden Pond, in which the people are real, the problems are real, and even the laughs come out of moments of truth. Nor and the Traveling North is open sporadically around the country. It's played in about 40 cities so far, and it's a real treasure, a sleeper that is worth going to the effort of looking for. I don't think it is worth the effort. Uh, you mentioned On Golden Pond, and as much as I didn't think On Golden Pond was a perfect uh, film by far, I mean, I thought it was a little uh, overly sentimental, this film to me is just as sentimental, if not more so. Uh, and I was less interested in it. I thought this was a stock character, the crusty old man. Boy, you talk about two cops being a stock character. Here is a stock character as well. Crusty old man has a medical problem won't behave. He's going to fight it out. I mean, I I was bored with him. How many movies like that have you seen before? I have seen many Can't movies. Can't name of one, I'll bet. No, I can't. Ron Golden Pond. No, no. I have seen plenty of films about tough old birds who have a problem and won't listen and won't behave. And it's oh, always a lot old of men. plenty of people like that, too. Yeah. But this is a very particular guy. Oh, no, I, didn't, I thought he was ordinary, ordinary, and I didn't think the performance well, as much course, as I'd like to Well, of course, the fact that he's ordinary is part of the magic of this movie, because he's not made into some kind of a character. He's made into a guy 
who worked hard all of his life and wants to settle down and loves this woman and loves his chair, Wait. likes to go fishing, likes right. to listen to the opera, and okay. knows he's going to die. Yeah. And certainly the last scene in this movie where he's found dead by his neighbors and by his wife is heartbreaking. Well, Roger, you just, I mean, to me to say now that I didn't, I wasn't moved by the fact that the guy is dead, which you just gave away, uh, would make me seem cruel, but I'm going to be cruel on the, the film. <laughs> I didn't think the character was that interesting, so his death did not mean that much to me. Well, it did to me. Now let's recap the movies that we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs down for Big Business with Lily Tomlin and Bette Midler as twins. I liked the movie more than Roger did, but it still did not utilize these actresses fully. A big split vote on the Japanese romantic comedy, A Taxing Woman. I think this is one of the most inventive and charming films I've seen in a long time. Roger thought it was a tedious mess. Two thumbs down for The Presidio, the murder mystery that is so simple-minded, it's insulting to viewers. Two big thumbs up, however, for Bull Durham, a wonderfully written and acted movie about minor league baseball. It's a gem. And finally, a big disagreement on traveling north about a crusty old man's struggle to live. I found him and the other characters to be boring. Roger loved it. So Bull Durham is the winner of this group, and I think Attacking Woman is terrific, too. Okay, and of course, I also liked Traveling North very much. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll review Red Heat with Arnold Schwarzenegger as a Russian cop and James Belushi as a Chicago cop, another pair of cops. And also, A World Apart, the South African drama starring Barbara Hershey that was a big winner at this year's Cannes Film Festival. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Nestle Crunch. It's creamy milk chocolate and crispy crunchies. Chocolate is scrunchious when it crunches. That's why you'll love Nestle Crunch. Bring your hair fantasies to life with Matrix Hair Essentials. Available in fine salons only. Hair. The trend is Matrix. Try a medicine. Serious allergy medicine that works even on your worst days. No wonder allergy sufferers trust Try a medicine year after year. Sony Videotapes. For taping your favorite movies, trust Sony Dynamicron ES. Whatever your videotape needs, there's only one name to play back. Sony.